Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Tracy Cook, and I'm the online media manager for ModernAnalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like you to welcome to you to today's webinar entitled, Four Easy Steps for BAs to Gather, Author, Approve, and Manage Requirements. Today's featured speaker is Yuri Wallach from Polarian. The webinar today will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. Please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the question feature of the GoToWebinar software. I'd like to say thank you to Polarian for sponsoring this event. And Yuri, please take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Tracy. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Uh You might be a little bit uh, surprised about you know, the Siemens logo in the top right corner. Um, I'll speak about Polarian history in a second, but basically we have been acquired by, by uh, Siemens PLM software. Um, I was a head of product management at Polarion, and now I lead the AOM division of, of the PLM software at Siemens. And uh, today on the agenda, I'll do a very quick introduction about uh, what Polarion was doing in the past, uh, where we are going together with Siemens in the future, and then I will um, speak about four, let's say, steps or areas in requirements management that I believe are extremely important, and I'll share with you some of the best practices that uh, we have identified. So, uh, the history of Polarion. Uh, they've been founded in 2004 uh, with a pretty disruptive vision to really provide a 100% browser-based unified ALM system application lifecycle management, so requirements management, quality assurance, and development lifecycle solutions really all packed together inside of one solution. Uh, we have uh, a 10 years uh, focus on unlocking the synergies, uh, providing the full traceability across the full development life cycle. And uh, as I said, we have been acquired in 2016 uh, by Siemens. Uh, but the good news is that our products will, uh, will continue uh, to, to help to drive the innovation of, of our customers. Uh, we just provide uh, uh, the same set of products just by a different brand. Uh, some numbers, uh, we have over the 250 Fortune 1000 deployments over 2.5 million of our users, all the uh, different uh, software development lifecycle uh, tools. Our product is very, our products are very extensive also. We have more than 200 extensions uh, where not just a few of them were actually developed by our customers and by our partners. So this is not what comes from us. It's, it's more like an app store behind uh, our, uh, our product line. And the community that works on those extensions uh, counts over the 15,000 uh, uh, members, uh, which is a, really a, a great number. So uh, let's start. So we all speak about uh, uh, the requirements management. And I always uh, think that it's quite important to uh, understand even the very high level best practices in the requirements management that starts with really some kind of the categorization of the requirements or understanding that there are really different requirement types. Uh, so the first one, the first categorization I would like to speak about is about standalone objects versus context sensitive requirements. What I mean by that? Uh, you can really track requirements in a, in a, in a two very distinct ways. The first one, is considering requirement as really some kind of a standalone object. So you read it as it is, you don't really need to, uh, uh, to access the additional data, and you also process the standalone object individually. So you can estimate it, you can approve it, you can plan it as an object. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, you might have this context-sensitive requirements, which are more or less typically the paragraphs in the specification document. Uh, some people think that I mean that the, the preferred uh, approach 
is on the left, so really to treat the requirements as a, as a standalone object. But our experience says that um, if, you, if you do it, you accept the fact that the requirements are a little bit more heavy, and they are a little bit more tough to write. And I believe that it's also fair to say that the most important about requirement is if it is really written and shared. So I also believe that, I mean, even if you go to the direction of really more the standalone objects like user stories, use cases, it's still fair to accept the, uh, the, the old-fashioned uh, requirement specification documents because they are very easy to write and definitely they provide uh, a lot of information that it would be much more difficult to, uh, uh, to track as a standalone object. So um, I already was referring to the, to the term user story. The very typical example of a standalone Greek format is an agile methodology that the user story, or if you do uh, some more formal uh, process, it could be also the use case object. So really something that is, uh, should be self-explanatory. And on the other hand, the context-sensitive requirements, these are typically the paragraphs in the specification that you need to uh, read in the context of a document. And you will see, I mean, that there is no easy decision, I mean, to say which uh, approach is really better. Our experience is that you should really combine it together, but whenever you speak about uh, a process of a requirement, you should really clarify is the requirement standalone or context sensitive because this gives you um, a good starting point. Um, as important as if it is standalone or uh, context sensitive is the question whether it is stateful or stateless. What do we mean by stateful requirements? Typically it means that uh, it's an item that is really somehow workable. So you really define something needs to be done for the version A. So the status of such a requirement could be it's planned, it's implemented, it's verified. It really holds the actual status of this item for a given release. It might have also additional attributes like estimate, like cost. On the other hand, you might really consider the requirements are more stateless. It means that it's, it's kind of just a specification only. So you really define what and not uh, when, in which context, um, stuff like that. So typically the status is just, I mean, is it applicable or is it rejected? So you really somehow just uh, track the information whether the specification is still valid or not. Uh, again, there are pro and cons for each variant. And whatever decision you would need to do in your requirements solution process, it's very good to rely first uh, on the decision whether it will be stateful or stateless. Uh, we recommend the stateless approach uh, anytime you need to develop uh, multiple parallel versions in parallel. And stateful objects are, uh, let's say, more applicable if you consider more agile approach that you track the user stories because really the user story is uh, uh, a kind of the uh, requirement and uh, it's fair to, uh, let's say, mark it as a, as a, as a requirement object. So this, this is really the categorization anytime uh, you, you, you start with requirements management or you want to make your requirements management process more formal, you should really think about stateful, stateless, standalone, or context sensitive and combine those principles together. I might come back to it uh, at the end of my presentation where you will see some, some examples. So the second topic I would like to speak about is a traceability because I believe that one of the reasons why uh, the customers of us are interested in, um, in adopting the requirements management tool or improving their requirements management process is to enable better traceability. But very often, I mean, the definition of traceability is not um, well understood. Some of the uh, people think that traceability just, is just about linking objects together. And that's why, I mean, I, I think it's worth to uh, repeat this definition of traceability that we gave to the market for the for, for last 10 years. And it says that 
Traceability refers to the completeness of the information about every step in the supply chain. It means it doesn't really matter if the requirement is linked to the test case. What matters is could you really prove that the requirement was tested? So actually there are a couple of components or types of traceability that we think it's, it's always important to uh, uh, ensure whenever the traceability is a concern or you would like to have your requirements making process more mature. The first one is accountability, so-called historical traceability, to understand who, what, and when of any change. For that, every single change must be identifiable and accountable. If you remember the, uh, the definition of traceability, ability to really track every step in a, uh, in a supply chain, this is really the historical traceability is essential part of that. The second important uh, component is the verification and validation. So more or less, really, the traceability is being used to ensure that you can uh, provide an evidence that the requirements, the initial needs, have been approved, designed, implemented, and verified at the end. So not just to link items together, but there is a goal of this traceability to have something verified and validated at the end. And the third component is a change management, where the change management could be, let's say, you can again speak about a passive approach, be accountable, uh, report a change, but it's, it has also this active part of that, uh, so you can study and analyze the impact of a change before the change actually occurs. And for that, uh, we, of course, provide the, I mean, all the capabilities as part of our solution, but let's say if we, if, we, if we forget about it, we understand that there are two major best practices for, to enable the traceability. First one is granularity of the requirements. We see too often that uh, the requirements are, let's say, not granular enough. You have a chapter in a, in a document, or you can, you can call a requirement a single document, or one PowerPoint presentation. That's why, if you remember at the beginning when I was speaking about the standalone uh, requirements versus context sensitive, the very typical problem, if you go with this standalone requirement uh, approach, that you will have the requirements not granular enough, so you could hardly measure the coverage. For example, how do you really ensure that all the uh, criteria of the requirement are validated if uh, the requirement is, is one big of uh, on block of text uh, attached to the requirement object. So that's, for example, one of the reasons that whenever you have the requirements too large, it's worth to really combine the principles together, have a simple small object, and then associate uh, a specification document to it, which uh, needs to be, let's say, traceable to individual paragraphs. Prevent unstructured documents. That's, that's also something that, of course, I mean, um, on one side I, I highlight how important it is it to, uh, to, to continue working in, the, in, the, in a document way where each paragraph is a requirement. Of course, I don't mean a traditional word documents because in that case the paragraphs are not identifiable. So you really need to use a solution that is that combines these two principles together. So it allows you to ensure that every piece of information, every paragraph, is traceable, and in the same time, uh, it gives you this uh, nice usability uh, of the uh, of the word interface. And the second best practice, very important for the traceability concept, is uh, how far you can go when you follow uh, the actual links. So to ensure the proper depth. Of, uh, of traceability. So it means that, again, you can have a, a solution where you can design your requirements or author and track your requirements and test cases, but if you are not able in the same solution to see uh, the test results, it will be very hard for you to ensure that you can, or to demonstrate that the requirements have been tested. 
So it's very, I mean, the, the, the best practices for the modern software development uh, lifecycle is to integrate or unify the requirements management into the ALM or PLM process. The third topic is uh, collaboration. Collaboration is something that uh, is becoming a commodity. I mean, any ALM or requirements measure tool today is uh, is referring how how it, it improves the collaboration. And most of uh, the solutions today are web-based, so it enables people to uh, connect from whatever place you are on the earth and access the requirements and modify them. I think this is really something that uh, you should expect from, from any kind of modern requirements management solution. Uh, but what we see as a challenge and what really needs to be uh, recognized as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a key requirement when adopting the, the requirements management solution is first to secure the collaboration and to enable you to collaborate in a context. What do I mean by to secure collaboration. I don't necessarily speak about uh, security in a traditional uh, sense where uh, you need to define the permissions, who can, who is allowed to see or modify what. It's more really to control the collaboration, to secure not who can change what, but who can change when. And this when is extremely important. That's what we call a workflow avert permissions. So it means that you set up your workflow definition on top of your data, and you need to you need to uh, ensure that the permissions, the uh, the collaboration happens uh, according to the to the workflow definition. So, for example, if you really have your uh, I don't know regulatory requirements, functional safety requirements uh, approved, you should I mean you should not be allowed to modify them uh, just by yourself without uh, starting uh, a change management process. So in our case, in our language, it means that the actual content is being locked, it's being read only if, uh, it, if the requirement is not in the draft status. So if, if it is approved, you need to go through the workflow uh, cycle and review it, analyze the impact on a test specification, analyze the impact on a, uh, on a product. It, it looks a little bit more formal, it looks like a little bit more bureaucratic, but in the end, uh, you know, it saves a lot of time if you really perform the impact analysis up front. So even, I mean, in a, in a very agile processes, we see that for major changes, uh, especially if, 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 if the functional safety or any kind of the security is a concern, uh, that you properly analyze the impact of the change. Workflow over permissions is also about uh, linking the, the, the actual user roles to the workflow. So you can set up the policy, uh, who can approve and review, who has to or should approve the data. The second topic was collaborate in a context. By the context in the software uh, development uh, process, uh, we typically mean a context of a release or context of a, of a change request. Uh, so it means that for every change, you should see that, I mean, all the necessarily changes are really linked to a given change request. So you can really ensure that for whatever the people are doing now, with the specification, with the requirements, with the backlog of the user stories, all those changes are really linked to the high-level business or change request. Um, some more principles about uh, how to secure the collaboration. One is really to provide the right guidance. So that's again uh, a very uh, great benefit of the workflow engine uh, which is really uh, an essential part in most of the uh, modern requirements management system. And it allows you really to not just control, I mean prevent people to uh, do some actions, 
but it also guides them through the right set of actions. So the people, the system uh, will guide you that uh, you cannot really estimate the story unless the version to which this story should be developed is set. Or uh, it, you can, it can guide you through the process that before accepting the story for the release, you really have to estimate it. You need to provide the, the, the risk analysis. When speaking about the traceability, uh, we were saying that it's very important to integrate or embed the, uh, the requirements management solution or tool into the, uh, into the full ALM or PLM system. It doesn't really mean that you need to or you will have the same user interface for all uh, different user roles. Fortunately, today, uh, I mean, again, it's not just Polar and also other systems. I mean, we, we developed a concept how you can share a data, but really provide different tools uh, to uh, to manipulate the data. At Polario, we really have it unified on top of a single repository, so we provide a little bit better way. Uh, uh, in terms of usability and uh, accountability, but even with the other approaches like linked data, uh, you can uh, ensure that you have the one data artifact uh, that is being presented in a different tools. So this integration doesn't mean really that you will have the project managers working suddenly with four documents. This is being resolved now uh, at the ALM um, solutions. So this is, for example, an example that uh, the, the one word-like document on the left side can be presented in a very different view, in a table view, which is a preferred view for project managers. So uh, it's great, I mean, to, to uh, be finally today able to share a data but have different tools to access the data. In the, in the second part of my presentation, this is probably the biggest part, I'll speak about reuse. Because reuse today is probably uh, the most challenging part uh, in, a, in, a, in a software development industry. The statistic says that 60 to 80 percent of requirements, code, and tests are being shared between projects. And First, what, what, what we need to understand that there are really different uh, reasons why uh, the uh, data are reused. The first one, we can speak about the regulatory requirements that simply have to apply to all your products. Uh, the second part could be that you really have a parallel version development. So you really work on a web application and you really need to develop or maintain one version, and in the same time you already version of, you work on the second version of the system, or you really need to really develop the full product line, which means that you uh, don't support different versions, but different configuration or different uh, variants of your software. So there are really very different uh, reasons or very different uh, types of activities you need to perform when you're using weak formats, and even more uh, important, uh, the approach to reuse weak formats could be slightly different to the approach how you re reuse, for example, a test. For a test, uh, you typically have something like a test library and a test plan that points to a single library, uh, but for weak formats, uh, we often need to speak about branching and merging. So uh, the way how I typically start explaining the, uh, the reuse uh, concepts that we think is, or concepts that are really able to resolve the, the today's needs is to start with this reuse maturity model. So very often, I mean, uh, if you really have multiple different products, multiple different versions, you might really uh, face a problem that you really have even 
not a standardized infrastructure. So the first step is that the AOM enables you to standardize the infrastructure for your software development process or product development process. It means that you can really develop the different versions or different variants uh, in the same way. This is a, a, a great value, uh, but when you speak about reuse, we need to think about the, the higher maturity model. So the first one is really the platform reuse. So how can I really easily specify the requirements for my platform that will be reused across the different products? And how can I ensure that if a product A requires a change of a platform, that it will not affect the other products? The second part is really the balanced reuse. This means that you already start thinking about uh, not just a platform, a core, which all the products share, but really about also some uh, commonalities or shared requirements between systems. And then the last is really to set up the full variance management um, uh, environment where you can really uh, develop uh, uh, a really big number of variants or versions in parallel. Uh, typically the, uh, the best practice is that whenever you need to uh, support more than 10 uh, different versions in, the, in, this, uh, in one time, or if you really have more than 10 different variants of your product in one single uh, moment, uh, it's, already, uh, it's already complex enough to really apply the variance management capabilities. I'll speak more about the, the last two points, the, the balance, reuse, and variance management, and the rest of, this, of the presentation. So, uh, it's all part about a product line engineering concept. So uh, the very typical way how uh, our customers start to deal with, uh, uh, with parallel versions or multiple variants is they simply clone and modify their requirement specifications. So they really have a different versions and any time they can create a copy and just start uh, a project uh, based on a different version of the system. Now you need to think, how can we really redesign this approach to take the advantage of the commonalities? And this is about what if you really gather all the requirements for the full product line. So imagine you have three products, green, red, and yellow, and you really think about gathering all the requirements for the full product line in the one place, and then you just think about a variant, a product specification, to be a subset um, of, the, uh, of the product line configuration. That's what we typically call the master requirement specification. Now, it's a it's module, it's, it's a document, it's, it's a project, it's a place where you really gather all the requirements for a product line. This means, what I mean by all, it means the core requirements, so these are, these are the requirements that are the same for all the products, the shared requirements, so it means these are the requirements that are shared between at least two products, and the specific. The specific requirements are those specific to a, uh, a particular product or a version. Uh, of course, a specific requirement could become a shared requirement in the future if you add a new variant, a new version in the future. Today we speak most about requirements. The same concept you can apply also to design and tests, but this is out of the scope uh, for today's uh, webinar. So if you really have the concept of the master specification to collect all the requirements for the given product line, we can think about the, the product specifications for a product A or B to be just a subset of the requirements of the core uh, of the master specification. And now the question is really, how do you achieve that? So first one is the change processing. So we have a master specification, we have a product specification that is uh, uh, a subset of the master specification, and whenever you need to to process a change, the change could result 
into a change of the product specification. So later, you merge this change to a master. So it means that whenever I need to do something specific for my product A, I could go directly to my product specification, modify it, and I need a solution to merge this change later to my master specification for future reuse. It means any time I would need to uh, adopt this change for an other product, I don't, I don't go product to product, but I go always through the master specification. The other approach is to, uh, if you have a change request, that you start with the master. So you always really uh, modify the master specification first, and you merge the change back to the product specification, and there could be an automated system uh, we can regenerate the specification for the given variant. So uh, these are really two primary uh, ways how to manage changes when you have the master and product specifications. Either to start with a master always and then merge the change back to the product or start from the product and merge to the master. What we highly uh, not recommend is to merge the changes from one product to the other because then you stop uh, benefiting from the fact that you really have this master product line with formats and you end up with some kind of a um, uh, branch help where you would really need to merge changes from one product to the other which are in conflict in the second um, uh, change so this is really not a best practice. I mean, so far, it might sound, uh, let's say, complex, but uh, you might miss the point, how do you really define a subset? So, I mean, we were speaking about the fact that you have the, the master specification for all the requirements, you have the product specification with the product-specific requirements being a subset of the master specification, we know that we could merge the, the, the changes uh, in the visual interface, but how do you really define a subset? And that's again linked to this maturity model. So it's great to start with the, re, with the uh, simple reuse of the modules, component specifications. This is really the minimalistic approach, this platform reuse. So you can easily just copy or let's say we call it a reuse a uh, uh, single component specification uh, to uh, all of your uh, projects. The more important is how do you really move forward? So how do you uh, reuse or define a subset of this shared requirements or specific requirements? The first approach is through the classification or through the linking. So uh, you can categorize the requirements by component, by library, or you can link the requirements to features, to the parts. So typically when you need to generate the specification for a given uh, version, for a given variant, you uh, filter, you search the master specification, you apply the filter uh, based on the category, based on the component, based on the feature selection. Uh, so it's like query-based definition. The more advanced is, or the most advanced, is to apply the requirements constraints. The constraint, uh, to constrain the requirement, uh, it means that you really apply a specific uh, restriction uh, to a requirement by referring to the features. You see that for both approaches two and three, uh, I refer to the uh, to term feature because the feature model is essential part of the variance management concepts. So the feature is a product line characteristic that may differ among members. It means it doesn't need to be just a functionality. It could be also the quality attribute. It could be a, a, a different market where you sell your products. It's just that Whenever you have two versions that are different, whenever you have two uh, products that are different, there should be uh, a change in a feature. So there should be a different set of features 
for the product A or for the product B. If the features are the same, more or less you have the same product. So the feature management is a central component of every product line engineering approach. And it really allows you to, uh, to, uh, to manage the common and also the, the varying parts. So when you define your product, as you see on the right, it might have some mandatory features, the core, and it might have the optional features, where the optional features could be shared with the other products or could be specific to my product. And then there is just a very uh, simple glue between the features and requirements, what in the variance management we call restrictions. So that's an expression language to restrict the requirements to features. So I could say that a given requirement will be applicable only if the, if the, uh, if the product will have the sensor data transmission, uh, if it will have power supply or the grid, and it also have the wired sensor as well. So you could really have a, a, a pretty powerful language to express when the, uh, the actual requirement is being uh, applicable. Uh, it, so it means this is the way how you really could easily define uh, the outcome for your product specification. So at the end you have the, the master requirement specification document or project, not necessarily a single document, with all the product line engineering requirements, product line requirements. You have a feature selection for your product and if you combine these two you can generate the actual specification of your product. And the product could be a, a mechatronics physical product with the embedded software, or it could be a, a software component. Um, we have customers who are uh, developing some special operating systems, uh, which needs to be really um, highly customizable based on the features the operating system provides. So uh, that's really the concept about how you can reuse uh, requirements in a very mature way uh, if you really man manage uh, a lot of different variants or versions in parallel. So uh, that was the core part of my presentation today. I was speaking about the different types of the requirements, stateless, stateful, um, standalone or context sensitive. We've been speaking about the best practices for traceability, especially, I mean, if you if you should remember one thing is uh, that's, that's the fact that you should try to keep your requirements as granular, as small as possible because this really gives the, uh, the um, then you can really benefit from the fact that the, the data are linked together. To secure the collaboration, not just uh, think about the collaboration as a discipline that everyone can change everything at the same time because they use a web browser, but really how you can really control it. And the third, uh, the fourth thing is reuse. And you think about how to leverage uh, the today's requirements management solutions because uh, not just Polarin, but you can really, if you, if, you, if you look on the market, there is a great technology available today uh, to, advance, uh, to advance your uh, reuse maturity. And uh, you can save a lot of time and money uh, and improve the quality by uh, not reinventing the wheel, but really reusing the assets from one project to the other. So I will open now the, the Q&A panel and uh, we can have a discussion. Okay, so let me just Uh, how is the active approach for change management supported? Okay, so uh, it means how do we really support the impact analysis for a change? So the first thing is that uh, the most important part of the impact analysis is really to understand what will be the impact of a change and where do you start? So you can start from the top or you can start from the bottom. So if you start from the top, uh, you can start thinking about here is a change that uh, is 
uh, the, the market is requesting, and you can go th uh, to the requirements and really uh, review what requirements should be uh, modified. The most important thing about the impact analysis is that you will also see the actual design or model, uh, architecture model, linked to the requirements, but we also actually link the actual source code to requirements. So when you, you, you could have the access to the information about if I change this requirement, what will be the impact to the model, to the code itself, uh, to the test specification. So really, through the fact that you have the data granular and linked, uh, you can estimate the impact better. One other thing is that it's not enough just to uh, provide a hint what should be uh, processed or reconsidered. You can also enforce that those additional artifacts will be really processed. It means that if I change a requirement, we have a concept of the suspect links. So the actual test cases or architecture elements or code could get really suspected, so you really know that these are the elements that you have to process, and there isn't someone who is really responsible to ensure that all those suspected elements will be processed. Uh, that's from the top. The other part of the impact analysis or change analysis is from the bottom. So considering that you can link the, the code, the change to a code, software code, to a task, and the task is linked to the uh, uh, requirement or user story, for every line of code, you really understand why it is there. So, I mean, the, the version control management system have the blame functionality, so you see who changed the line, uh, I mean, who is responsible for the final modification, but you don't see just who, but you have also the link to the actual task and requirement, so you can understand much better uh, if I modify this line, uh, will it have an impact on some other feature? Uh, okay, there are lots of really great questions. Let me start from the, uh, from the top. Uh, Ah, this tool seems only focused on traceability and linking, reuse of requirements. How does it help with gathering? Okay, uh, I'm sorry I missed this gathering phase a little bit, because this is really something that we also uh, consider uh, uh, something that we provide for a long time to the market. So we don't speak about those capabilities uh, enough. For gathering, uh, there are lots of options that you should consider. The very important thing is that whatever solution you choose, I mean, you will have the stakeholders that could work directly with the system, and then you will have external stakeholders. So what do you think is a very essential part or best practice for the gathering phase is to always uh, accept the fact that not all the people will be online connected to the production uh, system. Uh, for that's, that's the uh, uh, fact number one, and the fact number two uh, is that uh, if you provide the option only to track the standalone requirements, you will end up with the requirements that are very big, not granular enough, uh, uh, so the traceability or the coverage uh, will not be measured properly. So we have been investing into ensuring two things. One is uh, to ensure that the requirements engineers, business analysts, could work in a document-like interface like Microsoft Word, where every paragraph is traceable, so it's, it's, it's linkable, so you really have the Word-like interface inside of your web browser where every uh, paragraph is a requirement, and uh, every requirement is being versioned, uh, every requirement is being, uh, uh, I don't know, linkable. But in the same time, you can take the specification, export it to Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, 
collaborate offline and import the changes back. Uh, you can collaborate on review or really on the, on the content change. Of course, if you work in the supplier chain, there are other um, uh, protocols how you bring external collaborators into the, uh, into the game, like requirements interchange format, REC or rec -IA. But basically, I mean, uh, just as part of this Q&A session, for gathering, uh, ensure that external stakeholders are involved and provide the capabilities, ensure the right usability, and we highly recommend this document-like interface because we see that the business analysts and requirements engineers, they, they were used to work with the documents. They know that the concept of every paragraph to be a requirement, and we believe that this is really the, uh, the right um, approach to still, uh, let's say, ensure that every paragraph is traceable and we have a very nice uh, user interface for that. How can we confirm exact requirement with traceability? Uh, the question is probably how we can verify or validate the requirement. Uh, so the first part is, again, if the requirement is granular enough, uh, you might have uh, a clear verification procedures to verify the individual requirement. So you can track the, uh, the both, uh, uh, let's see, manual or automated test cases and link it with the requirements. And as, as I said, if the requirements management solution is integrated into the ALM, part of the ALM system is also the quality assurance part or test management, so you can also execute the test cases. So you can really measure, uh, uh, for example, what are the test, what are the requirements that have most of the associated test failures or really ensure that uh, measure the coverage between the requirements and test results. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the fact is that you really need to link the requirements management product with the QA or test management solutions uh, to ensure that the traceability will give you the right re result, which means the verification and validation. Um, there are many other questions. Uh, will the PDUs be self-reported or do we need to report uh, on our own? And that's a, most of it is self-reported, but this really defines, uh, de depends how you really define uh, the actual workflow. So if you have the, uh, the question like that, please uh, contact us. It's, it's a little bit tough to explain uh, here just uh, in, in a discussion. But it, it, it mostly it will be self-reported. Uh, wow, well, there's one story a uh, pretty long one about a horrific experience uh, to meet a sign-off deadline. Um, I'm sorry, but this is such a long story that I would be more than happy to, to, uh, to speak with you directly. So if you can contact us uh, through the um, Modern Analyst or directly at info at polari.com, uh, it would be definitely, uh, we'll be more than happy to, to help you uh, let's say, go through your, your, your topics. Uh, you mentioned that you estimate uh, just the stateful requirements. How do you estimate the stateless requirements? Um, that's a good thing. Uh, so where do you actually hold the status if not in the requirement itself? For that, we typically uh, split between the specification and the actual work item or work package. So we introduce a new work item type called work package, where you specify really that's an activity to deliver those requirements in a specific version. It means that not I mean that not one work package for thousands of requirements, but requirements could be uh, heavily overlapping. 
So it doesn't mean that for each requirement you will create an underlying task or work package, but uh, you will have you will perform an, uh, an analysis what needs to be done to develop those uh, requirements, and you really create the, the work packages. This is similar uh, to the agile way. If you speak about the user story, uh, you still might have the, uh, the non-functional requirements being tracked in the specification document and just more or less link the user story with the non-functional requirements. Uh, where the non-functional requirements are the very typical, uh, uh, typical uh, stateless requirements. So, uh, yes, you need to keep this information somewhere else. For that, you need to have another object. We call it a work package or user story, depending on the uh, on the on the uh, methodology. And then you think about the story itself. I mean, you know. If you are familiar with Agile, you know that the user story should have a clear uh, message like I as a user would like to, to get this and that, but typically you also need to define additional constraints. You really need to provide more a better definition of them. And that's exactly where this definition needs to be granular. So the individual requirements has to be traceable. And that's that's really the uh, the very similar story. So you really separate the specification, the paragraphs, traceable paragraphs, and objects like user story or work package. What is the best method to get a requirement from a difficult uh, stakeholder? Uh, what is our experience is that the, the, the most important thing is don't push them to give you the requirements in a way how you would like uh, to maintain your requirements. Uh, we have helped a lot of uh, customers with, with adopting the Agile principles in the requirements management. And we have seen that some of the stakeholders were really not, for example, able to provide the requirements formulated as the user stories. Uh, in that case, I mean, the, 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 the most um, beneficial collaboration is really to ask them to really uh, provide the input in any way. It could be an Excel document, it could be a Microsoft Word document. And then you can import this into Polarin so you really still have the original input and you just derive the actual user stories or uh, use case diagrams or use case objects from the requirements and you link them so you really have uh, the bidirectional traceability. So if the stakeholder will provide you an updated information, you still have uh, the possibility to, uh, to use the suspect links to see that you need to, uh, let's say, validate the, the specification of your user stories, things like that. So, the, I mean, from the tool vendor perspective, one thing which, which I consider as best practice is uh, try to be open in accepting the requirements in any way, because uh, uh, any kind of the written requirement is better than no requirement. Okay. Uh, is the feature in product line requirements, uh, product line engineering, the same feature as in uh, feature driven development? Um, it's called feature in both uh, cases, but it's it's slightly different thing. So the the feature driven development is, is really more uh, you really try to have your system more iterative. You try to break down your system into smaller features and develop them uh, feature by feature. Uh, that was the original uh, idea behind uh, feature-driven development. The, the feature in the protoline engineering concept is just consider that this important thing. 
if you have two variants, if you have two products, they are the same if they have the same feature selection. So the features are how you actually uh, define the differences between your products. So to some extent, it might be similar to feature-driven development, but the most important thing is that you really do the abstraction from the requirements. You really start from the, from the top. How would you like to differentiate your product? Uh, what makes your product different? Is it really the capability? Is it, is it a functionality? Is it the target market? Is it the environment, uh, mobile platform? And based on that, you just ensure that for different features, you might have different requirements. Um, can you provide a copy of the presentation? Uh, yes, uh, we can uh, provide a copy of this presentation and more, uh, even more, I mean the presentation will be recorded, so definitely uh, yes. Do you generate test cases uh, from requirements automatically? Um, I haven't seen a, a customer that would generate all the test cases automatically just from requirements. If you follow some uh, um, some concepts like uh, uh, BDD scripts, behavior-driven development, uh, uh, special language, how you define your requirements, you could definitely generate some of the test cases. Uh, we typically, on Polar side, we, we automate uh, the generations of the of the skeletons of the proxies for the test cases, so you at least know what uh, what is the scope what should be tested, but the actual testing procedure has to be uh, coded uh, or specified manually uh, by an engineer. I think that's that's all for today. We are almost at, at one hour. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, questions. Um, uh, it was a nice discussion, uh, even though it was more uh, controlled through your textual questions. But it was a pleasure to uh, reply to your, to your questions. Thank you once again. And thank you, Yuri. Today's webinar was excellent. We would really like to thank you for such a great webinar. And the questions were excellent as well. Thank you to all for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with the slides and a recording, is being archived and will be posted to the modernanalyst.com website in a few business days. Thank you very much, and this concludes today's event. Have a great day.